Now, some of you might know what socialism and war refers to. Uh, this is the book that was published by Lenin and Zinoviev in 1915 or 16. It is, not, it is not a discussion about what war will look like under socialism. Uh, in fact, we're going to abolish wars. Um, now, the, um, the, uh, the question here of socialism is uh, it's really a different word to describe social democracy. Okay, socialism here refers to social democracy or the labor movement. That is the position that Marxists should have towards the war. In particular, the position that Lenin took on the war. A war is a decisive moment in human relationship and human, human society. It puts uh, everything, raises the stakes in the class struggle. <laughs> this will be an interesting video recording. <laughs> It mobilizes all of the resources of society into the war effort. And so all the conflicts and contradictions in society will post in the sharpest possible way. Uh, the German military theoretician Clausewitz he said that war is the continuation of politics by other means. And that is very much the same as the Marxist position on war. That is, it's not a question of being in favor of war or against war in general. Neither is it a question of who started the war, who fired the first bullet. It's a question of the character of the war that is being fought. Is the war a war between classes? <laughs> like... I didn't do that. <laughs> like, for example, a civil war, or is it a war between two economic systems, like was the case when the, uh, Germany attacked the Soviet Union? Is it a war of national liberation, the war of the oppressed colony against its imperial master? Or, as is often the, mostly the case, is it an imperialist war? <laughs> that is, a war between the exploiters over the, the, uh, the loot. A war over the control of colonies, which was the case in the First World War. Or uh, a war over markets, <laughs> investments, etc. <laughs> and so the character of war determines our position or attitude towards that war. 
But it doesn't necessarily uh, resolve the question of what slogans to put forward in that war. I will go into this later. Also, the character of the war can change over time. And this uh, um, was, for example, the case with the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, in 1870. Uh, this was, on the one hand, in the early stages of a war, it was a war of national unification, where Germany, which was a splintered state, a nation of many different principalities, the German Revolution had failed to accomplish the historic task of unifying Germany. And uh, the Prussian military uh, monarchy wound up fulfilling this task instead. And for this reason, in the early stages of the war, Marx and Engels actually supported the Germans. But the character of the war changed during the war. With the Paris Commune, where the Paris workers rose up, and the German Kaiser, as well as the cooperated with the uh, French regime. In order to suppress the Paris workers. <coughs> and obviously, in that, in that case, the, uh, the uh, Marx and Engels supported the Paris workers against the Germans. So the character of the war is a complicated question. In some, sometimes. Uh, and this also was carried into the heritage of the Second International. In the beginning of the 20th century, this took on a very, uh, became very important. It was clear that the, imperial, the contradictions between the imperial powers were getting uh, sharper. As the German economy had outgrown the British and the French, and thus the German capitalists were demanding their share of the plunder from the colonies. And on the other side of the Atlantic, the American economy also developed tremendously. So, a, a redivision of the world was uh, necessary. Or at least, from the point of view of Germans, this is what they desired. And uh, there were several pla uh, flashpoints in the lead up to the First World War. There was the Agadir crisis and a number of other similar crises. And then there were the Balkan Wars, which posed the question very sharply. The Ottoman Empire was collapsing, and a number of new nation states were created in the Balkans. And these threatened the Austro-Hungarian Empire. 
ungarische, also ungarische Regime bedroht. And, and threatened to drag in uh, Russia, Austria-Hungary, and thereby Germany and France and Britain into a world war. And the second international correctly characterized this as an imperialist war. And they recognized that the duty of the Marxists was to oppose such a war. And this was done in three different, at three different international congresses. Uh, in Stuttgart, in Copenhagen, and in Basel. Um, I'm going to quote a little bit from this resolution. I hope the translators will have patience. If a war threatens to break out, it is the duty of the working classes and their parliamentary representatives in the countries involved, supported by the coordinating activity of the International Socialist Bureau, to exert every effort in order to prevent the outbreak of war, by the means they consider most effective, which naturally vary according to the sharpening of the class struggle and the sharpening of the general political situation. I think this is quite clear in terms of what the duties were of the Marxists and the Socialists and the Social Democrats at that time. And there were, there were some caveats put into the resolution, as you might have picked up. But the general thrust of the motion is quite, very clear. It continues. In case war should break out anyway, it is their duty to intervene in favor of its speedy termination. And with all their powers to utilize the economic and political crisis that is created by the war to rouse the masses and thereby to hasten the downfall of capitalist class rule. Again, this is very clear. Furthermore, they actually added a description of precisely how uh, the, the contradictions that were, were developing on a world scale. They added a very precise description of the developing Balkan Wars. And how it could unleash a world war. And they wrote a war between the three leading civilized peoples on account of the Serbo-Austrian dispute over a port would be a criminal insanity. So they very clearly described which one of happening. That is, that is the dispute between Austria and Serbia wound up being the flashpoint 
that caused a general outbreak of the war. For reasons which was not totally determined by the actual conflict. And they said that this would be a criminal insanity. <laughs> that is, that the French, the German and the British workers would fight each other in the trenches. <laughs> they threatened the uh, bourgeoisie with a revolution if they started this war. <laughs> It also explained how the great powers were using the question of national self-determination how they were using the national self-determination of the small nations in order to further their imperialist aims. And by implication, it also explains that this question of national self-determination is subordinate to the general interest of the European working class. That is, whatever you might, your opinion might be on the particular uh, nations and in uh, the Balkans, for example, the rights of the Austro-Hungarian nation, the nations within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The question of Albania and the question of Bosnia and Serbia, etc. That these cannot be used uh, in order as a pretext for war. And that means for any of the great imperial powers. And they were all using this particular question as an uh, excuse for uh, entry into the war. The other one, obviously, was the poor Belgians. Who all the great powers were planning to invade. <laughs> it so happened that the Germans got there first. But it has been conclusively shown that the British were also planning to get invade Belgium. <laughs> If they had the opportunity, and but they were all, uh, but the French and the British then started having making a big song and dance about the Belgians. And this was then echoed by the Social Democrats in those countries. In a similar way, the German Social Democrats. They justified their vote because Russia had attacked Germany. And obviously, uh, the reactionary saw no one wanted them to conquer and uh, invade, uh, dominate Germany. But these are all excuses, which doesn't really explain uh, what the war was about. And the resolutions of the Second International had answered the points in advance. They, they had explained that it was an imperialist war, that the Marxists should not support this war under any circumstances, and that they should utilize the crisis to overthrow capitalism. But as uh, most of you will be aware, 
And most of the parties around Europe voted exactly the opposite way. The exceptions were in Russia and in Serbia. Um, and the, it meant the end of the international. In fact, they, um, the international broke into two. Uh, between the two warring parties, the two alliances, with the uh, Germans and the Austrians on one side, and the Entente parties on the other side. So they uh, divided on the basis of the national bourgeoisie. And in all countries, the Social Democratic parties won by being advocates for the war. And they participated in war commissions and so on in order to mobilize the efforts for the war. This also happened in Russia, in spite of the repressive nature of the Tsarist regime. Particularly towards the end of the war. As, as all the regimes entered into crisis, then the regimes were forced to lean on the labor leaders in order to prop, prop themselves up. Uh, which was uh, implicit also in what was said about the in the manifesto before. Now, the first attempt to re serious attempt to re-establish international was the Simmerwald Conference. And you've all heard of the uh, three stagecoaches. Uh, and this is a, um, it was what uh, Jen Lenin joked. Lenin joked, yeah. But it was also literally true. Simmerwald yes, uh, is a village on top of a mountain. And in order to get up there, all the delegates had to fit into three stage coaches. <laughs> is it outside Basel? Is that right? Or is it Bern? It's outside Bern. There you go. Uh, anyway, they produced an anti war manifesto. <laughs> but it shared some of the problems of the previous uh, manifestos of the Socialist International. <laughs> now, um, uh, so although the, these defending from the of the Second International are lots of good parts of it, which I read out. They also had uh, some clear pacifist lines inside of it. I think, uh, yeah. Okay, a German translator here just read out something from his uh, text message. <laughs> 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 but uh, basically, the, they had phrases which basically fed illusions in the ability to stop the war breaking out. 
And this again, in a sense, these pacifist problems were echoed again in the Simmerwald Manifesto. <laughs> And you developed the Simmerwald left, which was where Lenin, Luxembourg, etc. found himself. So there was a split in the Simmerwald. And then there was a split in the Simmerwald left as well. And the most serious question that was posed was the relationship to the old Second International. Well, Lenin in, Lenin in particular was adamant there could be no reconciliation with the opportunists. And he was completely correct. Because um, what was on the agenda was not uh, a return to the the pre-war situation. But the struggle of uh, the struggle against the capitalist system as a whole. And it was quite clear that the opportunity opportunists, the right wing of social democracy, had no intention whatsoever to carry out the struggle. And that was another reason why the war broke out. In the lead up to the Second World War, there was a rising tide of a class struggle. There was a massive strike wave in Russia. There was a uh, major struggle in Germany over uh, suffrage, the right to vote. There was a number of militant strikes in, in Britain. There was an attempted coup d'etat by the king in Sweden in 1914. So, so there was a rising tide of a class struggle. And one reason why they started the war was to try to push that tide back. Uh, to divert the attention of the masses. In particular, the backward layers of the masses and the working class. But also, through the war, they might be able to, sell, uh, to get some uh, spoils from the war. And thereby being able to use that money, the extra resources, in order to get uh, some breathing space. And if you uh, study the Treaty of Versailles, this is precisely what happened. A treaty was worked out where the um, uh, allies, the Entente, gained at the expense of Germany and Russia. And they worsened the economic and social situation in Germany uh, uh, in order to get money to be able to keep the living standards up a little bit higher in France and Britain. In order to stave off revolution in France and Britain, they pushed the revolution into Germany. So the war had transformed was transformed into war between nations, into war between classes. And it's from that point of view where Lenin's uh, famous uh, phrase revolutionary defeatism comes in.
And what he said was this. A revolutionary class cannot but wish for the defeat of its government in a reactionary war. Rather than a social peace, in order to keep the war effort going and win the war, which is effectively what the right wing of social democracy did, it's the duty of revolutionaries to convert the imperialist war into a civil war. Now this is actually what happened. But it was also the program that Lenin set out in 1915. And he poses in a more sharp way what was already there in the previous manifestos of the Second International. Well, it's also important to remember that he, in these writings, were addressing himself to the cadres of the world, uh, international movement. And this is an important distinction. In fact, a little bit later, he advises socialists to pose things differently when speaking to the masses. In reality, it wasn't a, it wasn't a principal difference between the two uh, ways of posing the question. But one can fill the, uh, we can pose the same thing in different ways. And what, and what he said to them uh, that socialists should argue to the masses is that the only road of salvation is the overthrow, the revolutionary overthrow of the government. And we will get a bit more into this in, in, a, in a little while. Uh, on the order of day was therefore a complete break for opportunism. And the preparation for a socialist revolution in Europe. And the February Revolution, incidentally, was a vindication of the Bolshevik position. Just like the November Revolution in Germany in 1918 also vindicated that position. Um, but there remained something uh, which Lenin called an honest defensism. And he talked about how, how there was uh, an honest defensism of the uh, peasant who was defending his land or the worker, uh, or even defending the gains of the February Revolution. And in reality this was an illusion. Obviously, if things had remained as they were, if the February regime had continued without being overthrown in the Socialist Revolution, all these gains had been for nothing. But the masses felt like they had something to defend. And the, this was uh, used to prepare a trap for the revolution. 
and in particular for the compromises. And the compromises here, we're talking about the SRs and the Mensheviks. And the compromises fell straight into the trap, which was the logical conclusion of their entire position. That is, we have, we have to support the bourgeoisie in Russia. And obviously a bourgeois regime in the epoch of imperialism is also an imperialist bourgeoisie. And in particular, it is tied to the interests of British and French imperialism. So the whole logic of that position was to continue to support the imperialist war. So, as you might have heard earlier this week, the, uh, the bourgeoisie in Russia started to provoke. They were trying to, um, they were testing the ground, seeing what they could get away with. For example, Milyukov's famous letter to the Allies, where he promised to support their war aims in the war. But also the Allies were very keen on uh, continuing down this route. Road. They were needed to distract the, t the attention of Germany away from the Western Front towards the Eastern Front. They were hoping that this would give them time to make a breakthrough uh, on the Western Front. Hopefully before the Americans arrived. Because uh, the American involvement uh, in, in the war wasn't uh, uh, was double-edged for the British and the French. Because on the one hand, obviously, to provide more troops to fight in the trenches, but on the other hand, it also meant that they had to pay part of a settlement after the war, an agreement. And proportional to, in some way to their participation in the war. <laughs> Which meant potentially giving over colonies, etc., to the Americans. So they were hoping that this uh, offensive in Russia would uh, give them the opportunity to make a breakthrough on the Western Front. But there was also political reasoning behind this. Whichever the outcome of this offensive, it will uh, strengthen reaction. And this is something uh, Trotsky pointed out in the history of the Russian Revolution. It will allow reaction, a chance to regroup. A new chance to reimpose discipline in the army. It also allowed them to break up the fraternization between the German and the Russian troops. <laughs> because ever since the February Revolution, there have been basically a stalemate uh, on the front. Uh, 
I, in, it, it, it became like an undeclared ceasefire. Where soldiers often would go over and talk to each other and uh, <laughs> exchange uh, uh, between the trenches and exchange uh, pleasantries and so on. And it's obviously threatened to further deepen the revolution in Russia and also spread it to Germany. But the reaction really mobilized around this question of the offensive. And it became known as the June Offensive. And it included also the accusations of uh, the Bolsheviks being German agents. Now the question is then, how do you respond to this situation? It would be a political suicide to raise the slogan of, of defeatism in this situation. In reality, the uh, defeat of the offensive was the lesser of the two evils. But still, one wouldn't pose that way when one speaks to the masses. And then impose the question differently. Um, in reality, their position on the war hadn't changed. And he explained very clearly that the imperialist aims that continue to still be there from the point of view of the Russian bourgeoisie and the uh, French and British imperialists. He denounced the uh, compromises for not publishing the secret treaties. For hiding the treaties that have been signed between Russia and the Allies from the masses. And he, he took this question very seriously. He even threatened a break with any Bolshevik who took up a position in favor of the war or the offensive. Now, the Soviets had issued a manifesto calling for the workers. Well, the Soviets issued a manifesto. Calling for the workers of the world to overthrow the bankers, the landlords, and the capitalists. Now, that, that was all well and good. But it was also extremely hypocritical. <laughs> because as, as Lenin pointed out, the, they had also put the bankers in the Russian government. They had not done nothing for, for land reform. They had also done nothing for the oppressed nations. Inside the Russian Empire. In fact, they continued. They actually suppressed a number of independent uh, parliaments that fr was thrown up by the February Revolution. And trample all over the rights of the national self-determination of the people inside the Russian Empire. So if one does that, how can one then walk around the world trying to convince everyone else that they have to overthrow the bankers, they have to recognize this national right to self-determination and so on. 
And he said, well, rather than doing this, why don't you overthrow the capitalists, overthrow the bankers, and to set an example to the rest of the world? Uh, denounce annexations and the oppression of small na nations, not just in words, but in deeds. <laughs> Give the rights for to the Ukrainian uh, people, the Finnish people, etc. Uh, abolish uh, or ban all the profits of capitalists from war profiteering. And uh, he also said they should engage in something that he called conscious fraternization. So rather than breaking up the unconscious fraternization of the soldiers with another offensive, they should make a conscious attempt to publish leaflets to journal workers and so on, campaigning for uh, the demands. And see, so that anything but this program would be complete phrase mongering. <laughs> phrase mongering. Um, so empty words, empty words. So the he was arguing that he should overthrow the provisional government. Lenin. Lenin argues he should overthrow the provisional government. The Soviet should take power. It should uh, nationalize the banks. It should ban the profiteering in the war industries. They should reject annexations, not just in words, but in deeds. And if you think about it, this is actually very similar to the position that Trotskyists took during the Second World War. And we're talking here about the British Trotskyists around the RCP and Ted Grant. We said that the best way of defeating Hitler and German imperialism is to overthrow British capitalism and British imperialism. It would show the German workers and set an example to the German workers to do the same about Hitler. And the policies of the imperialists were exactly, was exactly the opposite. Of trying to push the German workers back into the arms of Hitler. <laughs> With um, anti-German uh, xenophobic campaigns, bombing of civilians, not guaranteeing the rights of German Germany after the war. So you can see there's a strong similarities here between the, those, the end, the position that Marxists took in the two wars at the end. And in the end, the Bolsheviks wound up carrying out Lenin's program. Yeah. 
When they took power in October, they did exactly what he had said they would. They, they published the secret treaties, which created a big, uh, massive uh, crisis around the world. Because obviously the Germans had access to all the different treaties with the Allies. Or the new Soviet government had access to these treaties, rather. So it exposed in the eyes of the workers of the world what the Allies' what real war ends were. As you're well aware, they also expropriated the capitalists. Um, and they issued precisely an appeal to the workers of the world to follow suit. Uh, and it did have an effect. Um, but it took a bit longer than uh, anticipated. Uh, during the, this conference, Lenin also insisted that there was, would not be any peace treaties with the capitalists or the Germans under any circumstances. Well, well, he didn't exactly say that. But he said they would not sign any deals with the capitalists of any country. But obviously the war carried on for another year after, after he made his speech. And the Russian army completely disintegrated. And probably the situation that existed in June 1917 didn't exist a few months later. The June offensive undoubtedly served to push the German workers more into the hands of the Kaiser again, or the German regime. The June offensive strengthened German reaction. And so um, the work of the Bolsheviks to convince the German workers of their intentions uh, would take a bit longer. But the Bolshevik Revolution ended the war in Russia. And the German Revolution, which followed not long afterwards, ended the First World War completely. And the subsequent years saw so revolution after revolution in Europe. And so, precisely the formula that uh, Lenin had proposed in the beginning of the war and also what contained in the resolutions of the Socialist International to turn the imperialist war into a civil war this is precisely what happened and so the whole Marxist position was vindicated by the events that took place um, but I don't have time to go into it but the German Revolution was defeated uh, partly because of a betrayal of social democracy 
but also the weakness of the uh, Marxist wing of the social democracy. Uh, and the Spartacus Bund that was thrown up by uh, the World War I. But the whole position that developed was precisely, the, the formula had developed around the war was precisely what enabled them to take, the Bolsheviks to take power. And the general outline of how to um, approach war, the Marxist position on the war, uh, found an echo among the working class. <laughs> And so this is also worth remembering when we approach new wars that appear in the modern period. Of how to evaluate, how to decide what position we take on each conflict. Because in the end, the only way to end war is to end capitalism. That's it.